The Welcome everyone to the Rutgers Center for Security, Race and Rights 2023 to 2024 uh, lecture series. This year's theme is humanizing the other. And it is intended to uh, host and feature nationally and internationally known experts uh, who are often also scholars or lawyers or advocates who work with uh, vulnerable communities or communities that are often othered within the United States or within uh, other countries. And it is my distinct honor uh, to start the lecture series with uh, today's lecture featuring uh, Professor Jonathan Hafetz entitled Punishing Atrocities and Fair Trials from Nuremberg to the War on Terror. But before I do my formal introduction to Professor Hafetz, uh, let me first encourage you to follow the Center for Security, Race and Rights on social media. We have Twitter account is RUCSRR and similarly for Facebook, RUCSRR and also on Instagram, Rutgers CSRR. We are the first and the only civil rights center at an American law school that focuses on the civil and human rights of Muslims, Arabs, and South Asians. And we do so through an interdisciplinary, transnational, and interfaith approach. So if you haven't already uh, checked out our website at csrr.rutgers.edu, we have a plethora of resources that you can explore and learn more in addition to uh, taking the time out of your busy schedules to attend our um, uh, lectures. And one other thing I will do is I will put a pitch for our most recent uh, policy report because we do issue policy reports every year. And this one is was issued last spring called Shining a Light on New Jersey Secret Intelligence System. You can find it online and it is effectively you know, an alarming reminder of how much surveillance is still a very serious uh, post 9-11 phenomena and more troublingly, I would say that there's very little oversight and there's very little transparency on what our government is doing uh, with the legal authorities we've granted them uh, in terms of utilizing intelligence gathering and surveillance authorities. And we're going to dig more into that during our lecture today with our featured speaker. So it is truly my honor and my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, John, Professor Jonathan Hoppets, who's a professor at, of law at Seton Hall Law School. Professor Hoppets is an expert on constitutional law, national security, and international criminal law, and transnational justice. He joined the faculty of Seton Hall Law School in 2010, and he is also the author of the books, Punishing Atrocities Through a Fair Trial, International Criminal Law from Nuremberg to the Age of Global Terrorism, published by Cambridge University Press, and that will be um, a large part of his talk today. He also published a book, a, a very a well regarded book called Habeas Corpus After 9 11 Confront Confronting America's New Global Detention System, which received the American Bar Association Silver Gavel Award for Media and the Arts honorable mention, and the American Society of Legal Writers Scribes Silver Medal Award. He's also the author of Obama's Guantanamo, Stories from an Enduring Prison, and the co-editor of the book, The Guantanamo Lawyers, Inside a Prison, Outside the Law. Professor Hafez's scholarship has appeared in numerous publications and it has been cited by numerous courts, including the U.S. Supreme Court. And Professor Hafez is the creator and host of Law, on Film, a podcast that examines the rich connections between law and film. And finally, there, there's a very long list, but I will end his, his impressive bio by highlighting that he was a Fulbright Scholar in 2021 to 2022 and a visiting professor at Rikyo University in Tokyo, Japan. And I am also especially honored that he is a, uh, affiliate, a faculty affiliate at the Center for Security, Race, and Rights. So without uh, further ado, I will cede the virtual floor to Professor Hafetz, and he will speak for about 20 minutes, and then we will uh, make uh, the Q&A available, the virtual Q&A available for our uh, online guests. Welcome, Jonathan. Uh, thank you so much, Sahar, and thank you um, to everyone, your colleagues who've helped put this event on, and uh, to your center. 
uh, which does such fabulous and important work. So it's really a distinct honor um, to speak to everyone here uh, and to talk about these issues. So uh, thank you, my, my, my gratitude. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk about uh, what's really kind of an age old question, uh, which is how to address the, in a sense, the enduring tension between law and vengeance in the connection with the commission of mass atrocities the killing and harm to widespread populations, wide, uh, large numbers of individuals. This in a sense has been an issue that I've grappled with since uh, graduating from law school. Uh, I graduated from law school just before, shortly before, a couple of years before uh, the 9-11 attacks and was after those attacks and the response have been involved in for now over two decades in addressing the issues and the rights violations connected with the US response to the 9-11 attacks, which I would qualify as a mass atrocity. So, uh, and now with the 22nd anniversary just passing, it's time to continue to, I think, to reflect and to talk about these and to connect it, uh, as I hope to do, to some of the larger themes of this series in terms of humanizing the other. Uh, and I'm gonna start with the Nuremberg uh, and kind of walk through that a little bit and then go up through the response to 9-11 and the war on terror in Guantanamo and hope to draw some broader conclusions. Uh, so the tension between law and vengeance uh, uh, and how to confront mass atrocities was front and center at Nuremberg uh, when after World War II and the Nazi surrender, there was a question about how to address the horrors committed by the Nazi regime. And the decision was made to uh, conduct trials of the Nazi leaders rather than as some, including uh, Winston Churchill had proposed to treat the Nazis as outlaws and just shoot them. And so I'm gonna quote uh, Associate Justice, Supreme Court Justice uh, Robert H. Jackson, who served as the chief US prosecutor before the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg in his famous opening statement. Uh, and, and I think he really expressed this dynamic. Uh, that the four great nations, the victories in World War II, flushed with victory and stung with the injury, stay the hand of vengeance and voluntarily submit their captive enemies to the judgment of law is one of the most significant tributes that power has ever paid to reason. And so this was an animating purpose of uh, the idea behind Nuremberg, and I think what has reverberated as something of a Nuremberg moment, that individuals who are responsible for mass atrocities should be uh, should face a uh, criminal trial. Nuremberg, of course, established the precedent for holding those individuals responsible, uh, Nazi leaders of, uh, for under international law for the crimes they committed. Uh, and it also created what I would call a, a narrative of accountability and an expectation that individuals responsible for committing grave crimes will be charged and prosecutors. But at the same time, it's very important to recognize that Nuremberg also created and established the principle that those trials must be fair. And I'm gonna quote uh, Justice Jackson one more time with my last quote, but there's so much in his opening statement that's uh, worth thinking about. Uh, and he said, we must never forget that the record on which we judge these defendants today is the record on which history will judge us tomorrow to pass uh, these defendants of poison chalice is to put it to our own lips as well. We must summon such detachment and intellectual integrity to our task that this trial will commend itself to posterity as fulfilling humanity, humanity's aspiration to do justice. And the Nuremberg trials, the original Nuremberg trial, the, the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg uh, after World War II uh, is wi was widely recognized as uh, essentially fair, that fair trials were, were uh, conducted. Um, probably the easiest way to quantify this is that, that there were several defendants, three of the original 24, who were actually acquitted, uh, and that a number of others were given lesser sentences. So I think uh, among Nuremberg's legacy is the idea of fair trials. And the Nuremberg has had an important impact, and as I said, launched this idea that after you have atrocities, there's a search for a Nuremberg moment. And we can see this development very briefly uh, if we look especially at the history um, since the mid-1990s, uh, where what 
after the Cold War, there was a revival of international criminal law and the idea of conducting trials for mass atrocities. So you have the international tribunals uh, to punish genocide uh, and other atrocities in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. You have the 19, uh, the establishment of the International Criminal Court under the Rome Statute of 1998, uh, which has jurisdiction to prosecute core international crimes, genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, uh, as well as the crime of aggression, and the creation of other, many other sort of hybrid or mixed domestic international uh, tribunals, as well as the strengthening of domestic laws uh, to prosecute war crimes. And today we can see kind of the power and the legacy of Nuremberg in the efforts to hold Vladimir Putin and other Russian leaders responsible for the invasion of Ukraine and the subsequent atrocities, uh, which incidentally the US has made a key aspect of the Western resistance to Russia. And an important part of this larger legal accountability movement since Nuremberg has been to ensure that uh, the trials of individuals responsible for mass crimes are fair and meet international human rights standards. So I wanna just talk for a minute about why fair trials are important when punishing mass atrocities. So why does it matter, right? Uh, you know, once you decide that you're gonna conduct these trials, why is it important that they be fair? Uh, well, first and perhaps foremost, they help prevent wrongful conviction. They ensure that you are prosecuting, holding responsible the right people for the right crimes and that sentences are appropriate if they're convicted. Uh, there's also a question of legitimacy. The trials are important, they're important to society, they're important to the international community, and they're important, I think, to the victims in, in a sense. Uh, I think this is one of the problems with, as I'll talk about with the 9-11 uh, defendants where you haven't had a fair trial, I think that's harmful to the victims as well. They're also important to the legacy and Justice Jackson really captured that in the quote that I read. Uh, and the legacy is often framed uh, in terms of more about us versus, uh, uh, rather than them. It's important um, in terms of how we view ourselves uh, as the, these nations that are going to uphold the law and the legacy we're, set, we're setting. Um, here though, I think there's been a little bit of a, a disconnect or shortcoming in the whole idea of fair trials for atrocities in that there's not, there's been insufficient uh, attention paid to what it means for the other and the idea of humanizing the other. It certainly fair trials for atrocities are about us. It's how about how we treat, it reflects on us or whoever the victorious nation is uh, on how we treat those who, um, who we believe commit, uh, committed the atrocities. But I think it's important to also remember this humanity and it can be very challenging to do that, especially when you have uh, the commission of crimes uh, on a mass scale, whether it was uh, Nazi atrocities through time, Rwanda genocide or Russian aggression in Ukraine or uh, the 9-11 attacks, which I'm gonna turn to now. And so I wanna uh, talk about the 9-11 attacks and the response to illustrate and unpack the importance of fair trials and to see what happens when a country uh, like the United States turns their back on this basic principle uh, as occurred after 9-11 due to the way the US treated terrorism suspects at Guantanamo and elsewhere. And so the recent uh, 22nd anniversary of the attacks provides another opportunity to reflect on the importance of fair trials in punishing mass atrocities and the consequences and of widespread and somewhat un uh, sometimes unintended consequences of denying those fair trials. So uh, as I think everyone is familiar uh, on 9-11, the US experienced the worst terrorist attack in its history, causing the death of nearly 3000 individuals, untold uh, economic harm and traumatizing the nation for years uh, even generations to come. Uh, in response, the U.S. led the U.S. led a military invasion of Afghanistan and sought to eliminate Al Qaeda, the group responsible for the attacks, and to remove the Taliban, uh, the government that had sheltered them from power. And in the process, the U.S. captured uh, a significant number of individuals in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, and elsewhere. Uh, and here, there was a critical decision made, I think a wrong turn. 
rather than bringing the suspected terrorist to trial in U.S. courts uh, to face charges, and we have ample, the United States has ample uh, uh, terrorism statutes to, that can punish people uh, up to and including with death, but rather than bringing them to trial in U.S. courts or even holding them alternatively as prisoners of war under the 1949 Geneva Conventions, which the United States has followed or had followed in previous conflicts, the U.S. subjected them to secret incommunicado detention as unlawful combatants. Uh, practically speaking, the U.S. disappeared hundreds of prisoners into what I've described as a new global detention system, which was made up not just of Guantanamo, but also of secret CIA black sites, which were these prisons in Europe and Asia, totally off the grid, where the worst abuses occurred. And to maintain this system, the U.S. argued that there were no legal rules or restrictions that applied to its detention and treatment of detainees. Detainees were, the U.S. Uh, argued, and this is the U.S. government at, at the highest levels from the White House down. Uh, the detainees were outside international law, human rights law, as well as the laws of war, which are deemed not to apply through a series of legal manipulations. Detainees at offshore prisons like Guantanamo were also deemed to be outside the reach of the U.S. Constitution, U.S. courts, and habeas corpus. And the United States dispensed entirely with the notion that detainees had to be provided fair trials. This led to torture and other cruel, inhumane, degrading treatment, which has been widely publicized, uh, including US military reports, and probably most significantly in a uh, US Senate Sec Select Committee on Intelligence report. Um, it's a, a long 5,000 plus page report but which is still classified, but over 500 pages, the executive summary had been released and you can read there what the details of what happened. You had indefinite detention without trial, which is uh, what characterized most of the 780 or so prisoners at Guantanamo. And then you had military commissions, uh, these newly jerry-rigged courts that were created to try a handful of detainees uh, without core due process fair trial protections. Uh, so focusing for a minute on these military commissions, uh, their flaws have been very well documented. The, the initial version of the commissions, uh, kind of their worst form, was struck down by the Supreme Court in a landmark 2006 decision, Hamdan versus Rumsfeld, uh, but then regrettably informed, uh, revived by Congress uh, with uh, the support then of the Bush administration and continued then with support of the Obama administration and every administration after that. Uh, they've been improved in some respects, but they are still significantly flawed. They rely on evidence or they can rely on evidence obtained by torture and other coercion. There's pervasive secrecy. There's uh, obstacles from lawyers, obstacles that prevent lawyers for detainees from accessing evidence and challenging the government's evidence. And then there's also the creation of new uh, I would argue made up offenses that distort the notion of war crimes to expand their jurisdiction. Uh, and every case that's been prosecuted in the military commissions could have been prosecuted in federal court, uh, but they were not because of this wrong turn that the United States made. Um, and the abandonment of the Nuremberg legacy, I think was best captured by Ben Ferenc, uh, who recently passed away. Uh, he was over hundred years old. He was the last surviving Nuremberg prosecutor. Uh, and he, I think, hit the nail on the head in terms of the problem and where the United States lost its way in abandoning uh, Nuremberg. And uh, uh, Ben Friend said, the guiding principles of the Nuremberg trials was that every defendant was entitled to absolutely fair trials. We worked hard to avoid falsification of evidence or torture of the defendants because as lawyers, we wanted nothing to taint these historic trials. Uh, the commissions have been, uh, in my view, in the views of many others on both sides of the political aisle, an abject failure. Uh, they've, uh, there have been eight convictions, six through plea agreements, um, and it's turned out that the fastest way uh, to get out of Guantanamo for most detainees is actually to admit you commit the crime so you can be uh, plea and leave Guantanamo as opposed to being stuck in indefinite detention. Uh, anyway, they, they're, of the eight convictions, half have been overturned uh, in whole or in part on appeal. 
Uh, I think by most significantly, the accused and self-admitted 9-11 mastermind, Kalichik Mohammed and his four conspirators, the men who are responsible allegedly for the worst attack in US history have yet to be put on trial after more than two decades. And there's no trial date in the, uh, on the horizon. In the meantime, hundreds of individuals, many innocent, uh, uh, all Muslim men have been subjected to torture and abusive conditions, uh, and they were held for years without trial. And the prison at Guantanamo still remains open. This underscores the Guantanamo experience and the military commissions underscore why fair trials matter so much. They open the door to wrongful detention and torture and abuse. If you had fair trial principles, you would not have had the torture. Uh, the torture in turn incentivized uh, uh, incentivized the avoidance of fair trials because the government couldn't put the evidence on. But I think if you start with the idea that you had fair trials, you wouldn't have had the torture. They've undermined US legitimacy, the military commissions have, um, including denying families of victims their opportunity to see justice done. And they've tainted the legacy of the US response to 9-11. Uh, I think they're part of uh, um, the idea of what Joe Biden, President Joe Biden said the idea about trying to get the United States back to where it was, this abandonment of international principles. Um, a lot of military experts have talked about the way Guantanamo and the military commissions have served as recruiting tools for terrorists. Um, but I, I, want, I think that's all true and important, but I wanna uh, go back to the point I raised earlier about the dehumanization of the other. And I think the military commissions and the denial of fair trials and other aspects of Guantanamo have reinforced the idea that the legal system can construct crimes and punishment based on the identity of the accused. In the absence of fair trials and the creation of this alternative legal structure of, of military commissions reflects and perpetuates Islamophobia that's crucial, that's been crucial to su sustaining Guantanamo and the narrative of a war on terror, undercuts the recognition of Muslim humanity and leads to a broad demonization of Arab and Muslims and especially Arab and Muslim men. Uh, it underscores that the failure to follow through on this critical aspect of the Nuremberg legacy, that is that the gravity of the crime makes it, if anything, more important that the accused receive a fair trial, not only has consequences for the self, that is for the, the, the United States and the prosecuting nation, but also for the other as it's permeated the entire US response to 9-11 and the treatment of Arab and Muslim individuals, not only at Guantanamo, but everywhere, uh, including, and I think especially domestically. And so I, I wanna conclude with a brief story of one client who I helped represent at Guantanamo when I was at the ACLU, Muhammadu Ould Salahi. Uh, Mr. Salahi was taken from his home in Mauritania uh, in late 2001 uh, for questioning, supposedly. He was then secretly rendered to Jordan by the CIA where he was subjected to torture, then to Afghanistan and finally to Guantanamo based on his suspected involvement in or association with individuals connected to the 9-11 attacks. He was subjected to brutal torture under a program that was approved by Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld including being drenched in ice water to deny him sleep for months, shackled in stress positions for extended periods of time, uh, suffering threats, not just against himself, but against his mother, and experiencing sexual, sexual humiliation to rattle his faith. In one documented incident, he was blindfolded and taken out to sea in a boat for a mock, mock execution. The government then remarkably unbelievably planned to use this evidence against him in a military commission and seek his execution. This was such a miscarriage of justice that the military prosecutor who was bent on prosecuting Mr. Salahi because he believed he was connected to 9-11 refused to move forward, uh, finding the case a disgrace. Mr. Salahi was held for 14, over 14 years, never charged with a crime, let alone given a fair trial before being finally released uh, to his home in Mauritania. Uh, today, he resides uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, now, some of you listening may be familiar with this story. Uh, his case is a prominent one, and he also managed to write a powerful account of his experience while at Guantanamo. 
uh, entitled Guantanamo Diary, uh, which not only was written while Mr. Sly was at Guantanamo, but was published while he was still there. This book, which I encourage everyone to read if you haven't read it, became an international bestseller. It was an acclaimed book and was also the basis for the award-winning film, The Mauritanian, which stars Jodie Foster and Tahir Rahim, among others. And I recommend uh, you see that as well if you haven't seen it uh, uh, before. Uh, Mr. Salahi's life and work stands the testament uh, to an effort to overcome the dehumanizing effect uh, of when we abandon legal principles, uh, including and especially the right to a fair trial, uh, and underscores that the harm is not just to us, but to others. Uh, and so I'll close with a comment from Mr. Salahi himself. He said, uh, after his release, I only have the law. And if the law fails me, I'm done. There is nothing else left for me. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. That um, brought back some traumatic memories about the worst days, you know, the, the, the peak of the post 9-11 uh, backlash. And of course, everything that we experienced in the US as, as Muslims and Arabs and those who were you know, mistakenly presumed to be so is nothing, sadly, <laughs> compared to what um, the victims of the Guantanamo extra legal uh, existence uh, experienced. Um, so I, I, I wanted you to provide our audience, which admittedly you and I appreciate this as law professors, you know, with time is increasingly farther and farther away from 9-11. And we now have students who were literally born after 9-11 or just around that time. And as a result, didn't personally experience just how much America changed in terms of its acting on its stated commitments to human rights and civil rights and international law. And they may have been privileged not to have experienced that reality by virtue of their own identities, or they may in fact have experienced it because they you know, were Muslim and were collectively punished. Um, so can you, as a, in, especially in your role as an ACLU and also as a scholar, and, and when we're looking at the domestic context, how did you, what were the observations that you had, whether it's from the political changes or the policy changes or the legal changes, where you witnessed this creep, this, this creep away or perhaps sudden disconnect away from these American values that we teach our kids in you know, public school and in K through 12, that we are a country of laws, that we are committed to the rule of law, that we are a country of equal opportunity and equality and justice. Um, and we believe that we are the beacons, right? We are the world exemplars of these values. Um, but as this you know, lecture series shows, there, is, there are many others who are not experiencing that same, they're not experiencing that America. Um, so what, what can you, you know, please elaborate on, on those shifts that you saw at the domestic level? Yeah, thank you for this excellent question, the opportunity to really unpack some of the domestic implications, uh, which I think are significant. Um, and I had initially, when I was in law school, kind of before the 9-11 attack was focused on those domestic issues and on immigration issues, which uh, are related to what you're asking about. And I think, you know, you can kind of go back, I'll start quickly with 9-11 and bring it up to present. But, um, you know, one of the uh, other responses to 9-11 and the, the domestic response uh, was, in terms of abandonment of legal principles, was the mass roundup of Arab and Muslims in the United States by misusing immigration laws, misusing the so-called material witness statute, which was designed to basically uh, ensure that someone who might have knowledge about a crime was around to testify, but was basically, both were misused to round up large numbers of Arab and Muslim, especially men, in New York and in New Jersey, in particularly where they were held, subjected to harsh conditions, detained for months and deported, having no, you know, I've never done anything, anything wrong, just guilt by association. And so I, though that was in a sense a, uh, uh, a less extreme version of what happened at Guantanamo in terms of the length of the detention and the treatment, but very closely related because it was an abandonment of basic due process principles. And this has continued 
for example, through uh, the way that uh, national, ideas about national security and Islamophobia have permeated the immigration system through things that were like uh, uh, the registration system, uh, other forms of restriction going up to something that um, people will be more familiar with because it's more recent path, the, the uh, travel ban or the Muslim ban that Trump initiated after immediately upon his taking office um, in 2016, which, which was based on broad stereotyping and denial of basic idea of uh, uh, due process. It's not a fair trial issue because it's not someone that gets accused of wrongdoing, but it's the same idea, just assuming certain people, uh, groups of people based on where they're from or what their religion are, are, are predisposed to uh, commit terrorist acts and demonizing these groups, including for political advantage. And so I think that's something that is very important uh, today, and, and it's something that has to continue to be uh, resisted, and something I've seen in, in work I've done, uh, in civil rights work I've done in the United States. And I'll add to that last uh, question about what is it that the Muslim, Arab, and South Asian communities can do moving forward, um, and having now had 22 years of experience, because my complete, you know, the trajectory of my legal career was almost 100% shaped by 9-11 uh, because it was an existential threat to my community's rights and liberty and life and ability to even uh, stay in this country despite being legally here. Um, so I, I think the most important thing is that we institutionalize our collective defenses. Um, civil society is robust in the United States, and I do think that that is one of its strengths as compared to other countries where autocracy is more prevalent, is uh, civil society can be nonprofits that are legal advocacy groups like the ACLU, the Center for Constitutional Rights, you know, there are many others, or it can be free press, or it can be just social movements, but I find them to, when they're well-funded, <laughs> they can be quite effective. And I, and I know that Professor Hafez was, was a key you know, actor in, in that post 9-11 um, movement to, to defend our values and try to make American exceptionalism not uh, a myth. <laughs> uh, and then I would be remiss not to say what is the obvious, which is to support the Center for Security, Race and Rights. So this center, I created the center along with others. We worked together so that we would have an institution uh, that would provide education, advocacy, research, um, community engagement, because we knew, and it's a very sad reality, that Islamophobia had become entrenched in American society. And that it was not just a blip, right? It was something that was going to um, change in form and maybe in degree, but it wasn't going to go away. And arguably, I'll put a pitch for my book, The Racial Muslim, you know, it, was, it, it pre existed in 9 11, but it, it certainly took on a level of severity that, that I don't think had ever seen, been seen historically with these communities. Um, so if you are an attorney or a professional, this, is, this does not apply to our students, uh, I do welcome you making a donation to the Center for Security, Race, and Rights. And uh, if you make a donation of at least $150, you will get a free copy of my book. Uh, and uh, we welcome, you know, the ability to provide these types of events free of charge to the public and any support that you can provide is welcome. Or for anyone, everyone else, do share our social media um, posts. And this lecture will be available on our YouTube channel. And sharing that with others is, is crucial. So uh, before we formally adjourn, I just want to give Professor Hafez uh, a few minutes if you have any uh, closing remarks. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sahar. And I reiterate to plug for your book. I think it's so important and, and everyone should read that. Um, well, I just go back to two things. One, just to kind of pick up on something you were saying before about uh, when we we're talking around American exceptionalism and its shortcomings. There, there was a belief among others, and I had you know a number of clients who were even as they were, yeah, you know, they detained without charge and subject to abuse, did say 
I'm surprised. I did think America was different. I mean, they knew sort of, uh, you know, America was problematic, uh, uh, certainly in its foreign policy, but at, there was some level of respect for uh, human rights um, uh, and dignity, at least at an individual level. So I think there is something there that's important to keep in mind and to take advantage of. And they were very surprised. They said, I expected this of my country. I expected this, you know, uh, like Mr. Slahi, I expected this when I was taken to Jordan. That That's not surprising that I would have been treated like that. But I, I really did think that this would not happen once I was in U.S. custody. And I've had a number of other clients say that. So I think that's something important to hold on to. A political advocacy is really important. I mean, for the Guantanamo detainees, it's hard because it's a small subset of population and really do need the courts. But I think on larger civil rights issues, the political political advocacy is, is critical. Um, and so you need to you know, advocate and ensure that you are preserve the democratic system that we have from the current assaults uh, so that uh, you, know, you are able uh, that Arab Muslims, other minorities, other racial religious minorities are, are able to um, uh, impact the system and ensure principles of equality. And to keep in mind, I guess that, you know, because it, it can seem uh, not daunting, but it's very easy to be cynical. You know, you, you, we talked a little bit about the disparate treatment of the, the January 6th uh, insurrectionists versus other people who've been suspected of uh, involvement in terrorism who are not white. Uh, and are not Christian, now they've been treated differently. Uh, I, I, think if, I think it's important to point this, this discrepancy out, not because you're gonna convince most people, I think you're not gonna convince most of the people who think uh, the election was a fake and the, you know, that this was a false flag uh, operation and uh, there was nothing wrong with what the January 6th people did. You're not gonna convince those people, but there is a group, a small group, uh, but it could be a pivotal group in the middle, uh, or the political independence, or whatever you might call them, will say, you know, it might the message might resonate with them. They might say, you know what, wait a minute, there is a point there. And that, uh, and I think that's, you know, kind of what you've got to kind of aim and keep that sort of smaller segment in mind. They're not people necessarily that are, you know, kind of in your camp, but they're not the kind of entrenched enemy. And, uh, you know, you may be able to persuade them. And I think, you know, maybe that's the best ultimately you can do, especially in the larger political struggle. So, uh, you know, keep fighting and hope. Thank you so much, Professor Hoffetz. I hope that you have, you continue to fight the good fight. Thank you to everyone who showed up. It, I hope that this inspired you uh, to keep that fire in your belly and to never give up hope. And, you know, we are the change that we seek uh, and to just find community and solidarity with those who, who share your values. So thank you everyone and I uh, wish you a, a pleasant rest of the day.